Welcome back! I'm glad to see you again. In the last video, I showed you how to read input on a GPIO pen. As an extended demonstration, I used GPIO pens to send and receive Morse code. Well, communication between IoT, devices, and sensors is kind of like Morse code. Messages are sent in a series of pulses across the wire. You can use GPIO pens like I did in the last video to send data like this. We call that process bit banging. The problem is, it's not very efficient. Luckily, most single board computers like Raspberry Pi have a dedicated inter-integrated circuit, or I2C bus. This is a serial bus that can be used to communicate with all kinds of devices. It's a lot faster than bit banging, and it's a lot easier to use. In this video, I'm going to show you how to interact with some I2C devices. I've selected a few devices that are easy to use, but you should be able to use this information to use the .NET IoT libraries to interact with any supported device. Before I can use my Raspberry Pi's I2C bus, I need to enable it. I'll open a terminal window and run sudo raspi config. I'll use the interface options menu to ensure that the I2C interface is enabled. Now I can connect devices to the I2C bus. Let's look at one now. This little silver box is a BME 280 temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor. It's a pretty common sensor, and it's available on breakout boards from many different manufacturers. The one on the left is from Adafruit, and the one on the right is from a generic vendor I found on Amazon. They're both the same sensor, but the Adafruit one is a little more full-featured, as it has both I2C and SPI interfaces. The generic board only has an I2C interface. For this video, I'm going to use the generic sensor. First, I'll connect the SDA pin to the SDA pin on my device. This is the wire that carries the data. Then I'll connect the SCL pins. This is the wire that synchronizes the clock for all the devices on the I2C bus. Finally, I'll connect the ground pin to ground, and then the sensor's voltage pin to the 3.3 volt pin on my device. This is the power supply for the sensor. To get data from the sensor, I'll create a new console app named Sensor and open it in my IDE. I'll add the iot.device.bindings NuGet package to my project. This is an open source library that uses our old friend system.device.gpio to communicate with a variety of devices. Using this library is a lot easier than writing the code to communicate with the sensor directly. I'll copy the code from the read environmental conditions from a sensor tutorial in the .NET IoT docs. Let's review the code. After the using statements, I create a new I2C connection settings object. The constructor takes two parameters. The first is the ID of the I2C bus on my device. The second parameter is the address of the sensor on the bus. The default I2C address constant is 119 in decimal, or 77 in hex. The documentation for the sensor I'm using specifies an address of 76 in hex, so I'll change that. The secondary I2C address constant is 118 in decimal, which is 76 in hex. Then I create a new I2C device object. This represents the I2C device, but isn't specific about what kind of device it is. It just knows that it communicates using I2C. I'll pass in the I2C connection settings object I created earlier. Finally, I create a new BME280 object, passing in the I2C device object. This is the object that represents the sensor. It knows how to communicate with the physical sensor using the I2C device object, so I don't have to know anything about the I2C protocol or the sensor's registers. In the main loop of the program, I first clear the text console. Then I specify that I want the forced power mode. In this mode, the sensor wakes up, takes its readings, and goes back to sleep. After waiting for the amount of time specified by the measurement duration property, I read the sensor's readings. One handy feature of the BME280 class is that it returns data using types from units.net, an open source library that makes it easy to work with physical units. After reading the values, I'll print them to the console. The loop runs once every second. Now I'll deploy and run the program. It looks like I'm successfully reading sensor data. 
Now that we've got the sensor reading data, let's add another device to the I2C bus to display the data. This is a 20x4 LCD display. It can display four lines of text, each up to 20 characters. It has a 16-pin header on it, and it's a little tricky to connect directly to your device. Luckily, displays like this are often sold with a GPIO expander connected to the header. The expander has a dedicated I2C interface that handles doing all the hard work for you. Connecting additional devices to the I2C bus is as simple as connecting more wires to the SDA and SCL pins on the GPIO header. Then I'll connect the ground and power pins for the display. Since this display uses 5 volts, I'll connect it to the 5 volt pin on my device. Here's the program we have so far. Let's add support for this LCD display. To make things easier, I'll go back to the .NET IoT docs to borrow some code from the display text on an LCD tutorial. I'll grab these lines of code that initialize the display, and I'll paste them into my program.cs right after the BME280 gets initialized. Since the variable names are a little ambiguous, I'll rename the variables to make it clear what they are. Then I'll use my IDE's quick actions to add the missing using statements so everything resolves correctly. Let's take a minute to review this code. Just like with the BME280, I create a new I2C device with the bus ID and address of the GPIO expander. I don't have any documentation for this display, so how did I know what address to use? Well, I looked at the chip on the I.O. expander, and in black on black text, only visible from a certain angle, it says PCF8574T. Most sources I could find said the address for this chip is hex 20, but that threw an exception at runtime. Then I read the datasheet for the chip, and it says that the default address is configurable between hex 20 and hex 27. You could easily figure out which address you need by trial and error, but the datasheet explains how to set the address using the chip's A0, A1, and A2 pins. A visual inspection shows that these pins are all exposed on contact pads on the back of the I.O. expander, and since none of the pads are bridged, the address is hex 27. After creating the I2C device, I use it to create a PCF8574 object. This represents the GPIO expander. Finally, I create a new LCD2004 object. This is the object that represents the 20x4 LCD display. It has a bunch of constructor parameters that map various functions to the GPIO pins on the GPIO expander. I got these values from samples in the library's GitHub repo, and they appear to work on every LCD display I've tried that uses the same expander chip. The parameters all seem pretty self-explanatory, but I wanted to talk about the controller parameter. Notice that it expects an instance of the GPIO controller class that we've seen in previous videos, so we're giving it a new GPIO controller with the PCF8574 object as a parameter. This is a little confusing, but it makes sense if you think about it. The PCF8574 class inherits from GPIO driver, so essentially we're creating an instance of GPIO controller that represents the GPIO pins on the GPIO expander. Now I'll add some code to the main loop to display the sensor's readings on the LCD. First, where I clear the console, I'll also clear the display. Then, to make things easier, I'll just duplicate these lines that print values to the console and modify them to print to the display instead. Next, before printing each line of text, I'll set the cursor position to the beginning of the line. This is necessary because the display doesn't automatically wrap text to the next line. To make each line fit in 20 characters, I'll abbreviate the labels. Finally, just because I want to show how useful the units.net library is, I'll change the LCD output to use US customary units. Time to deploy it to the device. Success! The sensor is reading data, and it's being displayed on the LCD. I'll use my heat gun to warm up the sensor.
Now I'll use compressed air to cool it down. I'd say the sensor is working as expected. Remember, even if you don't have the exact devices I showed in this video, the concepts are the same. You can use the iot.device.bindings library to connect to lots of different devices. That's all for now. In the next video, I'll show you how to use an analog to digital converter to read analog data.